Good morning, PVG family. So good to see all of you. John says I have to do the introduction, and I said I don't want to. The truth is I'm not feeling good. My back's been hurting for a little over a week. I'm not sleeping, and I'm crabby. But sometimes we're in pain, and sometimes we're facing, you know, we come to church, and we're not in a good mood, and we're not feeling great, and we're not feeling like, let's just stand here and worship and smile. But that's okay. God meets us even there. And so I would just encourage you today, no matter if you're in a good mood or crabby like me, um, that we have a God who meets us where we're at and doesn't expect us to be okay all the time. He sits with us in our sadness and he sits with us in our pain. And so stand with us today or sit. If it's more comfortable to sit, that's okay too. You can worship from sitting. It depends on how you feel. Again, God's not, you have to stand and raise your hands and this is how you have to worship. No. Just come and enter into his presence as you are.
Fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My failure doesn't matter either. And sometimes we let our failure and our fear get in the way of our pursuit of the Lord. We think we're too far distant from his grace and his mercy. But the very definition of grace and mercy is that he still pursues even if we don't deserve his pursuing. So we can't move too far away that he can't reach us today. So I just want to encourage you today, if you haven't named the name Jesus out loud in prayer, in some sort of invitation to him to join what you're doing and to dip into what he's doing, I just want to encourage you today to say the name of Jesus, you know, without all the trappings of our culture, to say the name of Jesus honestly today as a way to reconnect, to invite him into what you're doing because he cares for you and his grace and his mercy will never separate him from you. So would you bow with me in prayer? Let's respond to the worship today. And, and I just invite you to say his name out loud and then just say, Lord, I love you today. Just that simple phrase will... Uh, will connect you in ways that uh, will change your life, not only your day, but your life. So let's just respond to the worship today. Say his name and pray a prayer of invitation today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for being wonderful. And yes, I love you today. I need you so much. You're a part of my life. name your name. We name your name with reverence and with awe, Lord. So many people around the world have attached your name to cursing, have attached your name, Lord, to some, some strong emotion, Lord. But God, it's the relationship that counts when we say your name. And so today, God, we seek you by saying your name. We respect and honor you, Lord, when we say your name. We want a connection with you today when we say your name, Lord. God, in our fear, God, you're the answer. In our failures, Lord, 
you're the answer today, God. So we come to you, Lord, with hearts wide open, with minds, Lord, ready to receive, with our hearts, God, ready to be changed. And we name your name yet again this week. Lord, we bless you. We want to honor you. We want to bring your glory, bring bring pride, if it, if, if it can be, to your kingdom, Lord, and your work among people. So, Lord, your name, Jesus, is on our lips today. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And everyone said, amen, amen. Would you just move around the room and uh, say hello to people that are near you and far from you and say hello today.
Okay. Well, it's good to be back after a week away. Um, much, most of you look the same. So, uh, and there's the exception. But anyway, I hear good things about last week's mm. picnic. How many of you were able to uh, attend the Teen Challenge thing? And yeah, most everybody. Cool. I want to say thanks for all of you that fixed food and uh, moved tables and chairs and all the prep that goes into such an event. I appreciate uh, all of your hard work. I know the board does as well. Look at your bulletin. Men's and women's ministries have activities this week and the next couple of weeks. Check that out. Uh, we do have prayer on the calendar for tonight at 6. It's uh, usually an intimate affair. We have it in the, in the foyer. And uh, so I invite you to join us. Uh, it lasts about an hour. And um, so if, if you're expecting long moments of discussion, you'll be gravely disappointed. 99% uh, of our time is spent praying. So uh, if you'd like to come to a prayer meeting and not a discussion group, that's at 6 o'clock tonight. <laughs> Today, we have the culmination of an effort that began a couple of months ago trying to corral people and honor them for graduating from certain educational institutions and processes that they've been uh, in. And uh, we did not have this, I don't believe, last year um, for various reasons. And I don't know if we did in 2020. Did we have something in 2020? Do you remember? Oh, well, we didn't last year, so this year we have both 2021 graduates and uh, 2022 graduates. So I want to invite uh, Dominic, Elise, Natalie, Jacob, and Sydney to the front. Just stand here and face the people in front of the communion table. There you go. So let me, uh, let me give the, uh, the details. So also on our list is Jake Card, Jacob Card, right? Is his name Jacob? Is that right? So he's at uh, boot camp, right? Is he enjoying boot camp? You have no knowledge. <laughs> oh, he got emotional? Uh, what, which emotion was it? <laughs> so Jake and, um, and Elise both graduated from Gateway High School this year. <laughs> Dominic graduated last year from uh, Westfield Technical Academy. Jake Robbins graduated this year from a homeschool education. And Jake, by the way, Laura put the school of Rebecca Robbins. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. Was that accurate? Sure. Sure, he says, whatever you say. Let's get this over with. We also have with us a 2021 graduate of Westfield State University, Sydney Adair. <laughs> and the elder in the group is Natalie Saloyo, who graduated this year from the University of Connecticut Law School. <laughs> I don't even know if we've met Natalie, but hi, how are you? <laughs> nice to meet you. I want to talk to you about some things I've been, uh, I've, I've struggled with, uh, with a couple of police matters, so <laughs> just stay after, no, I'm just kidding, I'm, ju I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for clearing that up. So, today, uh, we want to just, why don't you just give them all a round of applause.
think each of them could uh, talk about their own situation and where they're headed and all of that, but um, uh, maybe you can approach them privately uh, afterward. We have a cake for all of you that we're going to eat some of today. Um, but by the way, it's our only refreshment after the service, so uh, make sure that you eat a small piece. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, the reception for this event will be held after the service. So make sure you approach these folks, and I hope they'll stay for a couple of minutes after the service uh, to enjoy a discussion with you. But I um, want to honor them today, and we also have a gift, and then we want to pray for them. So each of you today are going to receive a card and, uh, and then a book. Now, let me describe the book to you a little bit, because I know some of you will be critical of this choice. So this is a book initially written in 1995, and you're saying, well, it can't be good if it's that old. <coughs> it's been updated several times, though. It's by Rick Warren. It's called The Purpose Driven Life, or What on Earth Am I Here For? <laughs> I think it's a good question to continually ask, and uh, some really great writing and uh, great information in here. But I think... Uh, the most important thing is it, it just asks you to think deeply about um, kind of the root issues of your life. It doesn't deal with your vocation or career choices or anything like that, but it deals with more important stuff uh, that you need to ask yourself. So, you know, if you just devote yourself to reading it over the next few weeks or a couple of months, uh, I think uh, your life would, um, uh, would be richer for it. So that's our gift to you. And, um, and then a card of appreciation. So um, uh, I'd like for you to stand as I pass out their books. Um, for some of you, if you'd like to come and stand beside them and pray for them, we're going to pray for them personally and, um, and ask the Lord to, uh, to bless them. So if you want to join me around the altar, that'd be great. Some of you. What are you doing there? I know, I know. <laughs> yes, please. Thanks. Thoroughly embarrassing each one of them today. It's our privilege to embarrass them. You know what? It would be nice if somebody had a little phone camera that was in good shape and could take a picture. Abby, are you, uh, are you technically adept at providing such a picture? She has her phone. I know, I know. So before we pray, or as we pray, or something like that today, um... We're going to ask you to smile real big. Very good. Thank you to both of you. Would you just reach out your hand and uh, let's each pray for them. Use your own words to, uh, to reach out to the Lord today on their behalf. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this group of people who have achieved a milestone in their lives. Lord, we know that you have so much more for them in the future, but Lord, to this point, God, like the people, Lord, in the, uh, the Old Testament, thus far you have blessed them, but Lord, we have every confidence that from this moment on you will also walk with them. Lord, I ask for each one of them, Lord, that not only will you inform their career and vocational choices, that you, Lord, will set up divine appointments for them in the area of making a living but, Lord, you'll also direct their steps in regard to relationships. Lord, that you'll also direct their steps, Lord, in terms of their, their um, life with you and their life, Lord, with the body that you've placed on this earth called the church. Lord, we ask for a deep, a deep, a deep contentment and, and peace to rest upon their lives, Lord, in the midst of all the stuff that surround us in our culture, Lord, Help them to find you and to focus on you. And, Lord, allow the God of the universe, the creator of all things, to guide their individual steps. 
We thank you, Lord, that Jesus modeled for us the kind of relationship and intimacy that only a friend can provide. And Lord, today we lean on the friend that's closer than any brother, the friend that continues to walk with us and has, has given us the opportunity for God with us in our hearts and minds, Lord God, to be closer than a friend. We thank you, Lord, for that intimacy that you have offered to each one of us. Lord, may they be brave and courageous enough to offer themselves to you, to invite you to be part of who they are, to help continue to shape and mold their minds, their spirits, their emotions. We thank you, Lord, for this moment and ask you, God, to deeply touch them in these moments, even today, Lord God. And we thank you for this opportunity to honor them. And all of us said, Amen. Amen. A few hugs would be in order. Cake will follow. I would ask the ushers to come forward and give us an opportunity to give. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for these folks that we've just honored. Thank you for the privilege of, Lord, putting together a family into which they have fit, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to serve them as they learn to serve you. And Lord, it's our privilege to give back to you, Lord, a portion of the things that you've provided for us. You have richly, Lord, given, Lord, not only your life, not only salvation itself, which is the best gift ever, but Lord, you continue to give us attention, healing, deliverance as we cry out to you. We love you. And give in Jesus' name. Amen. The question was raised Does my conscience flow? Simply let so Yeah. 
Thanks, John. Thank you, worship team, for their for your ministry. Great introduction to our message today. So maybe Jim Croce said it best. You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit in the wind. You don't pull the mask off that old Lone Ranger, and you, you don't mess around with gin. Maybe that's a good intro or not. I'm not sure. But regardless, today we're going to talk about spitting in the wind or blowback. You see blowback in uh, teenagers uh, when they feel a sense of independence and begin to push the status quo. Of course, many two- and three-year-olds are doing that already. But, um, but nonetheless, teenagers actually have the ability to maybe get in a car and drive away. They, they step out on their own and sometimes begin to push right past the guardrails that you and I have, as parents kind of set up for their protection and sometimes it doesn't result in any problem, no harm, no foul, but often their actions of pushing against the status quo have unintended repercussions, which we'll call today blowback. So we're in Hebrews chapter 6 in a series called It's Jesus. And the point here is that Above all things, and even in the midst of social and cultural issues and pressures and the culture wars that we're right smack dab in the middle of, it's Jesus, that our focus should be on Jesus. Not that we're disregarding the issues, not that we shouldn't have a voice in the issues. We should have a voice, we should have strong biblical stands, but at the, the end of the day, our message is not a reaction to the Roe versus Wade controversy. Our real answer for people should simply be, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. You know, Jesus has been, has been uh, the, or Christians and the church have been labeled as enemy number one in so many circles. And, and sometimes we have been real idiots in the way we've reacted to certain social issues. Uh, can I hear an amen? And so we deserve some of the criticism that we are getting, but often we do not. But our message is not an opposition or a belief or a support of a particular social issue. Our message is Jesus loves you, and that's what it's always been, and that's what it should remain. It's Jesus. It's Jesus today. Good opportunity to just jump right in and say amen. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate that. I'll give you a $10 bill after the service. Very important. So here's the other, the flip side of that coin today. Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 12, spitting in the wind, blowback, 
let's read the scripture. Should be found there in the beginning of your your uh, your sermon notes. So if you'd like to read it with me, that's great. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless as and is in danger of being cursed in the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope Sure, we don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what's been promised. So, let's dig into this today and just remember our theme, this, this uh, blowback situation. This portion of the chapter 6 has three sections. Number one, the devastation of falling away, number two, an example from farming, and three, a gentle admonition. Let's take each section at a time. First, it's a pretty harsh warning of falling away and rejecting a relationship with God. I mean, it seems at face value, it seems like, wow, if, if I walk away from God, God will let me walk away, and I'm in danger of well, being separated from him. The writer says it's impossible to be brought back to repentance. Interesting use, use of the word impossible. Not ill-advised, but impossible, he says, to be brought back to repentance if, if you've been enlightened or had your eyes open to spiritual truth, have tasted the heavenly gift, you have a life with Jesus, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, You've been regenerated, you've been baptized, or both. Number four, you've tasted the goodness of the Word of God. And five, have tasted the powers of the coming age. It's impossible to find repentance if all of that has happened and you choose to walk away, to reject that relationship. And the author says it's like crucifying Jesus all over again. Really graphic, isn't it? It's like... It's like you're, you're putting Jesus back on the cross for a redo and you're taking the hammer and you put the nails in the wrist and, and in the feet and you just do the whole thing again and jarringly place him down in that hole at the cross and all that, you know, all the stuff that you saw in the Mel Gibson film. It's like crucifying Jesus all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. That's really what Jesus experienced, right, on, the, on Calvary. He experienced public disgrace. People spitting at him, people je uh, jeering him, all of the Pharisees making fun of him. You know, here he's a, a physical mess, bleeding and, and, and uh, dirty after dragging this cross partway across Jerusalem. He's on a cross. It is a disgraceful place. In fact, the law of the, of the Hebrews said that it is a shame. It is a, a, a deep shame to be crucified. There was Jesus. Well, and so the author is trying to make a brutal point and saying, if you walk away from your relationship with God through Jesus... You're doing that again and subjecting him again to public disgrace. 
Then the writer shifts into a farming example. It says, a farm that receives rain, the crops grow and feed those that need it are blessed by God. Great piece of land. But then he says, land that receives the rain but produces thorns and thistles, it's useless, it's, it's unproductive, and it's in danger of being cursed or just burned, so at least the damage can be limited. We can turn the soil back over and try again. There's no fruit in that field. There's nothing to harvest in that field that has produced thorns and thistles except destruction. There's no blessing there. There's no provision there. The final section, though, turns a corner. It's a gentle, caring pat on the head that says, you wouldn't do that, would you? You, you wouldn't turn away from Jesus, would you? You won't make those kind of choices, will you? Your salvation means more to you than that. You, you, you'll be somebody who bears free fruit, won't you? And then the writer lists the good things that many of those people have accomplished as a way to encourage them to keep going, to persevere, to not give up. Don't quit on Jesus. Don't quit on Jesus. So this, is, this passage, as you might expect, along with some of the same sentiments in chapter 10, is one of the most controversial scriptures in the Bible. The doctrine of our larger body called the assembly of God believes this passage can largely be taken at face value. In other words, it is possible to have become an authentic follower of Jesus, to rebel, walk away from your salvation, and walk yourself right into an eternity without God. The other doctrine, the other doctrinal stance, historical doctrinal stance says once you are saved, God is big enough to keep you saved and will keep you regardless of your behavior post-salvation. That God's grace and mercy is inevitable and once dispensed can't be undone. So in every age, there have been followers of God who've turned away and left their seemingly close relationship with Jesus and, and, uh, and, and have not returned. We're tempted to say that, well, these people really never knew Jesus. In fact, I have a friend that is uh, in the other tradition, and he's been a friend for decades. And sometimes we'll have, we've had this discussion in the past. We don't have it anymore, but... You know, I'll tell him, you know, what about this passage? What about this uh, once saved, always saved routine? He says, he says, well, the truth is, Randall, that these people that said the prayer, that said the words, probably weren't saved at all if there was no obedience or if they disobeyed afterwards. And, and I, you know, under my breath, I'm saying, yeah, but I disobeyed yesterday. So <laughs> I, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do with that. We've had this discussion over and over again. But some people have really been absolutely life change. It's true. It's right. You see it. They work hard. They, they love Jesus. They serve people. They love people. Their life has obviously changed. Yet they still turn away and seem to illustrate the essence of the passage today. They don't come back. But I think it's impossible for them to come back to God because they just don't want to. They don't want to return. It's not like they feel like they can't. It's that they simply have no interest. But, you know, some interpreters, as I said, of this passage criticize those who take it at face value because they believe we're saying one can never know if you're saved from one day to the next. Oh, man, I bet if Jesus came right now, I wouldn't make it. I should have never said that. Oh, God, if you're there, if you're still alive, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, good, I'm saved again. I'm saved again. 
oops, today I made another mistake. I'm headed to hell. All is lost. Oh, Jesus. So back and forth we go. We're in the kingdom. We're out of the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. We're out of the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. No, that's not what we teach or believe, even if we see this scripture at face value. Let's talk about salvation. Would you like to? All those in favor of me continuing to preach and let's talk about salvation, please raise your left hand. Yeah, <laughs> some of you have no clue which, which one's which. So, our salvation is, listen, it's a multidimensional act of mercy by God. It has nothing to do with you and I. It begins with a moment called regeneration, at which point the Holy Spirit drops a divine deposit in our heart and begins what we could call a residency program within us. There is a witness of the Spirit in our lives that we are gods, that Jesus is our Lord. It's at that point, that drop of divine divinity in our hearts, it's at that point that we become new creatures. We don't become perfect new creatures. We just become new creatures. However, salvation is also a journey because although we now enjoy a spiritual union with God, our sinful nature is not eradicated at regeneration. It is not eradicated at regeneration. Now let me be clear. The penalty for sin has been taken away, but our sinful nature remains. How many of you know your sinful nature pretty well by now? How many of you know that people sitting around you know it better than you do? Absolutely. So we enter a lifelong process called sanctification. Say sanctification. Sanctification. There's got to be a little, <laughs> little gap. Sanctification. Let's call it purity in progress or salvation as a journey. And it only ends when we leave this life and enter the next life. And at that point, we enter eternal union with God. This passage references the space between that salvation, regeneration moment and death. What did our journey of faith consist of? How much of what God wanted for us did we accept, did we embrace and allow to become part of our journey? In practical terms, we think about our daily schedule, how much God time is included in your, my daily schedule. When we listen to music, what are the lyrics that are described? How, when we read a book or we watch Netflix, what kind of morals does it ascribe to? Do we go deep with people that love God or are we going deep with those that don't know God? And that's affecting us little by little or a lot. In essence, the question we all have to ask ourselves is this, what is the substance of our journey with the Lord? What is the substance of our journey with God? I think uh, one character from the Old Testament leaps out at me as kind of the poster boy for Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. His name is Saul. Saul was a tall, handsome kid that became Israel's first king. He was an introvert to the max. Samuel now, the, by way of context, Samuel was the last of the Israelite judges, regional leaders who took on national influence in the several hundred year period before Israel's entry into uh, the monarchy and several hundred years after they entered the land of Canaan under Joshua. So Samuel, as the last judge, was a great prophet. He was a great leader, but his adult sons were manipulative and entitled. Therefore, the people rejected his sons as future leaders and instead said, we've had enough of this judge stuff 
we need a king. Samuel relents to their pressure, goes to God. God sends him the, uh, the appointment to go and anoint a boy or a man that's out looking for his dad's stray donkeys. That would be Saul. So here's what happens next. Saul is found by Samuel, and Samuel tells Saul, as you approach the town that I'm going to send you to, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, flutes, and harps being played before them. They'll be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. From the Old Testament perspective, that is a salvation experience. You will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. God is with you. That's a description of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. That's the description of the paraclete. God is, God is with you. God Emmanuel, God is with you, but also the paraclete, one called alongside to help. So there's some New Testament references here that are very strong in this Old Testament, Old Testament description of what happens to Saul. Go down, go down, um, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God's with you. Verse 8, go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I'll surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. In other words, we'll worship God together. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you're to do. And here's the summary statement, verse 9. As Paul, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. God changed Saul's heart. So far, so good. So far, so good. The passage indicates there's a change of heart, that it's orchestrated by God. Samuel predicts it. The writer notes that it happened. The Spirit of the Lord came on Saul to prophesy, but also changed his heart. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit usually came upon people for a particular act or a particular season, but we don't hear about that Holy Spirit influence again like we do beginning in Acts chapter 2 or in John 14 through Jesus' description of the Holy Spirit's arrival. That's the New Testament. The Old Testament concept is the Holy Spirit arrives for a particular reason on somebody and then we don't hear of that Holy Spirit again. But in certain situations, the Holy Spirit, it looks like, came and stayed in Saul's life and in David's life, for instance. Yet what I want to illustrate in Saul's life is even as a person whose heart was changed by the arrival of the Holy Spirit, he began to decline over the next 40 years of his life. His journey to destruction culminated in his death on a mountain surrounded by his army which was destroyed and the death of his adult sons who were scattered around him. And by the way, a note to all of us, a journey into destruction, a blowback situation always takes our family with us always takes our family with us. Sometimes harming, always hurting, sometimes destroying, but always leaving a mark. Saul's story is a classic example of a believer who falls away and never comes back. As you read his story, the signposts along the way flash neon. It seems that the root of his personality is a deep sense of inadequacy. I should be here. I don't belong. He, uh, he, 
he spends most of his life trying to build distance between that weak teenager and prove that God's choice of him as the first king of Israel was the right one. So he had this drive to succeed, and it made him impulsive. It meant he listened to almost no one for advice. And as David began, began to be prominent as one of his primary generals in his army, Saul used that moment to really drive a wedge between him and God by accepting the compliments offered in, in song to him and David uh, because his, his uh, math was lower than David's because his, his addition was lower than David's, that his victories were lower than David's. He took that to mean that people didn't consider him to be as adequate as David and at that point, a root of murder was placed in his heart that he chose to ignore and fed and fed and fed until he tried to kill David repeatedly, not only once, but for years after it took root in his heart. He's never able to move past that murderous intent to a place of personal peace never returned to serving God. He's unable, he was unable to change. He was unable to sustain his life change under the Holy Spirit's direction. So, a sobering message. If you have a little time this week, it might be good for you to sit down, comfortable chair, it won't take you long. Take your Bible. Look up the passages that have the life of, life of Saul in them. And just watch the downward spiral that he takes and identify those significant moments that mark that deepening slide into his bitter madness. Then read the passage from Hebrews 6 one more time and ask yourself, what's my journey like? What, what's been my relationship with God from that moment where he and I met, where I met God. What, what's been the pattern, your journey, your salvation as a journey, your path to purity? Are there some signposts that you and I have rushed past that have unfortunately left a mark in our lives? Is there a relationship? Is there a point? Is there a, a marker somehow that has driven a wedge between us and the Lord? Is there a growing darkness that's creeping in around the edges of our life because of certain influences, certain relationships that have begun to mean more to me than my relationship to God? But this isn't simply about you and your salvation. Today, this is about you and me and us, and your salvation. Because as we described a couple of weeks ago, this is an us process, this thing called church. It's, it's an us relationship, that there is a responsibility for all of us to not only care for one, one another, to love one another, to serve one another, but also to watch out for one another. Do we see things in one another that if left unchecked and not confronted might lead to a slide into darker places? The writer of Scripture says it's incumbent on us to snatch each other from the fire, as it were, if we see such things taking place. In the old days, we called people that walked away from God backsliders. I think the impression was that if they slid back, they could slide forward again, and in many cases that's true. But some people seem to just spit in the wind, and spitting in the wind, that blowback experience is causing great harm to their lives. And that, I think, is the key issue with issues that if we're not careful, the issues will overrun us. And even our stance 
which is loosely based on a particular scripture, maybe drawn out of context with the totality of scripture, will prove to be a wedge between us and the Lord because the Lord's desire is that we love God and love people. And if we're combative with people and hating people, it seems like somehow the issue has drawn us away from our mandate from God. Does that make sense? We must be careful in our handling of even biblical issues to not be so strident in our opinions that we drive a wedge between us and the people we're supposed to love because if we do, that wedge will begin to work its way between ourselves and a loving God who, by the way, loves those seemingly unloving people over here. And that brings us to communion. Do you see the connection? Rich sees the connection. Rich, I'm glad you came to church today. Today I want to use, I want you to use the, um, the communion moment to, to be a time of reaffirming and recommitment to the Lord. Pardon me. I want you to use this as a time to reconnect and uh, to be soft in the Lord's presence. Some of us have grown a bit crusty and caustic, and, and our faith has not been soft toward others. It's become hard, and we become one of those Christians. But I want you to reconnect with the Lord. I want you to grow comfortable with, as you pray for people, to cry a bit because you care about them, because you love them. And if that crying thing is gone, if there's no emotional connection when you pray with the people that you're praying for, something, something is amiss. Something is amiss. There's a disconnect somewhere. There's a, a wire that's just touching every once in a while, but it's in danger of falling completely away and not making a connection anymore with the Lord. Judy, if you'd give us some music and for prayer and for communion, for reflection today, I'd greatly appreciate that. Thank you. So let's reaffirm our relationship with the Lord. Let's recognize His tremendous gift for us. Recognize the value of a relationship with Jesus. Recognize the message of faith and hope and love that God has placed at the center of our relationship together. If we could today, can we tighten up our link to the Lord? And if we find ourselves in our reflection moments, knowing that we're wandering away, knowing there's a wedge, we can name it, we can put a date to it. If there's wandering away from Jesus today, would you use these moments to reconnect? And by the way, there might be somebody here today that's never connected. And I want to offer you that opportunity in very simple terms to ask Jesus to become Savior of your life. To really offer you and prove to you that his death was for you personally, that there is a relationship available to you personally today. Cry out to Jesus, name his name, and begin this process of being a saved person, of being a follower of Jesus today. And if you'd like for someone to pray with you, 
we'd be glad to do that today. Would you stand with me? Today I'm going to ask you to serve yourselves. And so for you to move to the center aisle, all of you together, form a line, form two lines, take the cup, take the bread, and then exit out the outside aisle and fill in your, your row as you, uh, as you receive the elements together. Has everyone been served? Would you hold the bread up? Jesus took the bread on the night he was betrayed. He broke it, blessed it, said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you, broken for you. Would you give him thanks? for his broken body, that his brokenness has purchased your wholeness, and that he is the bread of life for you. He's the sustainer of life, whether it's physical life, the provider of eternal life, physical life, your emotional landscape. It's Jesus. It's Jesus today. Would you thank him for his broken body today? Take of the bread together. Hold the cup. 
step up, please. Thank him today in your own words for his spilt blood. The Bible says because of his death, the spilling of his blood, we are heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ. And his death purchased for us life with God forever. But more so than that, that his blood, his blood has eradicated the results of sin, which is death, and provided instead life itself. And he has taken away the penalty of sin in our lives. Would you thank him for his spilt blood today? Let's partake of the cup together. If you're able and willing, perhaps you could lift your hands, even at your waist, and offer the Lord one more thanks and one more praise today. Let's... Uh, Give the Lord praise today. Would you join me? Lord, thank you for these moments together today. We thank you, Lord, for the strength, the ability, God, to turn to you, Lord, even in our wandering, even in our wandering, to know that you will be there, God. Give us strength when we are wandering. Give us purpose, Lord God, to reacquire a hunger for you, Jesus, today. And we'll give you thanks. I don't want to be remiss in not offering you a moment to meet with uh, someone for prayer today, so I'm going to ask the prayer team that's assigned for us if you just take your place at the altar. If you guys up there in the booth could just keep the music going. If you uh, today would like to pray with somebody personally, um, there's going to be members of our altar team uh, ready and able to, to meet with you. I know they want cake too, right? So don't eat it all. But if you came today with a need for healing and, and uh, for help, I just want to invite the prayer team to, uh, to be available for you. And if there's anyone here that today you'd like to take up that offer of meeting Jesus for the very first time, I would encourage you to come and meet with a member of our team today. So if we could keep the conversation to a minimum in the sanctuary, that would be greatly appreciated. If you'd like to linger a little bit for your own personal prayer time, uh, I encourage that. And if you, you're here, we'll be here for a few moments uh, to pray with you personally. Thank you for coming to the house of God today. Amen. Amen. Bless you.